Amen. Amen, amen, amen. That, uh, that gentleman right there, that's Will Reed. He's a friend of mine. He's a leader here at the church. He oversees a ministry here called Discovery Covering. It's on Thursday nights in the Fellowship Hall. Every Thursday night, like clockwork. Food at 620, service starts at 7. It's a discipleship recovery group. And if you know anybody or if you're here struggling yourself uh, with a life controlling habit, and you might go, man, I don't drink. I'm, I'm not, I don't put straws in my nose. I don't do any of that. But you know, did you know fear can be a life controlling habit? Did you know pride can be a life controlling habit? Did you know overeating can become a life controlling habit? You know, there's different life controlling habits. So, it's for everyone. It isn't just for a select few. It's for everyone. We all have hurts, habits, and hang-ups <clears throat> that we need the body of Christ to gather around and help us with. Uh, my name is Pastor Mathen Poole. I'm the discipleship pastor here at the Springs Church. Thank you so much for coming out and being a part of our service here this morning. And maybe this is your first time here. Give you a little context of what's happening. Is We're in a sermon series right now called Share Your Story. And as our lead pastor, uh, Pastor Owen O'Sullivan, is out in Ireland at this time, uh, he has gave the permission for some of the pastors here to preach and to share their testimony. So we were talking about this a couple of months ago of what we we're going to do. And he goes, I want everybody to share their testimony. And he's like, Pastor Matt, do you mind doing that? And I'm like, okay, I get to do two of my most favorite things in this world to do. That's uh, first preach. And the second one is to share my testimony. I'm like, praise the Lord. Yeah, count me in. No problem at all. So we will be in Mark 5 today, Mark chapter 5, and my story is, is entitled The Storm of Hopelessness, The Storm of Hopelessness, Mark 5. You can go ahead and get there. I'm going to bless the word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the spirit of living God, Lord, that we feel here, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the word. Lord, we know the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, Lord. Lord, and I know the word does not come back void. Lord, I know as the word is proclaimed, as the word is preached, Lord, it will fall on soil, Lord, and it, there will be a harvest that comes forth, Lord, and I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, and I thank you, Lord, for the anointing, Lord. I know the anointing is what breaks the yokes, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you anoint my lips. Lord, I pray, Lord, you anoint this word. Lord, I pray, Lord, you anoint the hearts of the people, anoint their minds, Lord. Lord, and anoint their ears, let it fall on good soil. Lord, we thank you for who you are, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A Revelations chapter 12, verse 10 through 11 says this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 through 11, we see a climatic end of time. We read about a war in heaven between light and darkness. And we also read here there is a victory in heaven and light winds. But not only is there a victory in heaven and light wins, but there's also a triumph for believers. If you'll look at your neighbor and say, we win, we win. And how did the believers triumph? How did the believers win? Well, it says right here in scripture, it says, by the blood of the lamb. See, this refers to the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, whose blood provides the redemption and the victory over sin and evil. See, there's power in the blood of Christ. I think somebody needs to hear that this morning. There's power in the blood of Christ. His power, his blood is sufficient for your life. See, that blood is righteous, and that blood is sinless, and that blood is precious, and the blood is enough, and we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. But it also says this. See, this is attached to something else here in Scripture. It says, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. See, you cannot separate the two. They're intertwined here. I can't point at my testimony without pointing at the blood of Christ. And I can't point at the blood of Christ without pointing to my testimony. And it said, we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. 
See, this highlights the power of believers' witness and the proclamation of their faith in Jesus Christ. See, there's power in your testimony. See, it points to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And every time we tell our story, it renews our hope, but it renews other people's hopes also. See, there's power in your testimony. See, I never want to stop telling my testimony. If we forget where God has brought us from, we will lose hope. I heard this minister say one time he was radically saved in the 70s and he preached for decades and still preaches today, a mighty man of God, a general in the faith. And in his younger days when he was preaching, he would always share his testimony or his testimony would come out. And this lady come to him, a seasoned lady come to him one day in the foyer and was like, every time you preach, you share your testimony. And I've heard it over and over and over again. And he said, ma'am, if I, forget, if I stop telling my testimony, I might forget it myself. See, there's power in your testimony. And if you lose your testimony, you will lose hope. And see, man without hope is an animal. All he is is in survival mode. All he is is let me just survive and do whatever it takes to survive. See, I've lived this. And I believe that we've all lived this in some capacity in our life. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're living this. Or maybe you're here and you've forfeited or you've surrendered or you've misplaced your hope, but I'm here to tell you those who hope in Christ will stand, but those who hope in this world will fail. See, this is my story. What's your story? We all have a story, and Jesus wants to become the center of your story. See, my story begins with hope in the world and hope in myself, but at the end of the day, I was hopeless. But my story ends with hope and Christ. Throughout the Bible, we see people without hope, but in a single moment, through a decision, through a single encounter, they find eternal hope in Jesus Christ. Mark chapter five, verse one through five says this. Then they came to the other side of the sea, talking about Jesus and the disciples here, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces and neither could anyone tame him. And always, say it with me, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones. Here in Mark chapter 5, you have, right off the bat here, you have this man that's introduced into this story of Christ in the gospel of Mark. You see this man here of the Gadarenes who has an unclean spirit that he's possessed by. A man that's tormented by a spirit of darkness, a spirit of hopelessness. And he's driven to a place of insanity. He's driven to a place of hopelessness. And he don't know how he got here, and I don't know how he got here, but one thing I know is this is where he is. And you see the life he lives here. He lives amongst the tombs. See, he's surrounded by death. He's rejected by society. Everywhere he looks is death, and nobody wants to have anything to do with him. He's wild and he's uncontrollable. He's unbindable and he's uncontainable. He would break shackles. He was physically free, but emotionally and mentally and spiritually so bound. See, he only had an illusion of hope. He only had an illusion of freedom. He had no freedom. He had no hope. But if you looked on the outside, he looked like he was so free to do whatever he would because they would try to bind him, he would break the chains. They would try to contain him, and he would break everything they put upon him. He's lost. He's crying. He's numb. And he's self-harming himself. Wandering with no direction. Hopelessness drove him to a place where he is so numb he has to hurt himself to try to feel something. It said night and day always he would wander in the tombs, cutting himself, crying out loud, trying to feel something. 
He's hopeless. He's in a hopeless situation. See, he's cold. He's broken. And all he has is the tombs to wander around it, trying to produce a feeling because he can no longer feel because of his hopelessness. See, when I read about this man's life, I have empathy. I can see this man's life, and I can see a picture of my own life when I read about this man that I speak of. See, I know how it feels to be filled with an abomination and have my soul taken by addiction. For over a decade, hell on earth, having my soul ripped away from me by the power of darkness and the darkness and the hopelessness of addiction, driven to a place of insanity, and I was hopeless with no hope and nothing. I was living in the tombs, surrounded by death. No matter where I looked, if I looked to the left, it was death. When I looked to the right, it was death. When I looked forward, it was death. And I, when I looked back, it was nothing but death. And this hopelessness drove me to a point of death. Because of my abuse and my addiction, I came to a place where I overdosed. And if it had not been for my wife coming in at a divine time, a divine moment, I wouldn't be standing here right now to speak to you. I'm talking about hopelessness here. See, see, I was so free. Nobody could bind me, but it was all just an illusion of freedom. It was all just an illusion of hope. See, the chains of addiction had me hopeless, and no matter what I did, I could not outrun them, and I could not break them. It was a taskmaster that drove me. It was a taskmaster that beat my back. It was a taskmaster, and though I walked around like nobody could contain me, I was in prison of hopelessness just like this man. So cold and so numb, numb lost, having to stick needles in my arm to produce a feeling. Can I feel some warmth? Can I feel something? Always night and day crying out, knowing there's more to life than this. There's more to life than this, but stuck in a place of hopelessness where I could not see past the brokenness. See, a man without hope is like a bird with no wings. He can't go anywhere. And because of no hope, I was stuck in a cycle of dysfunction. I was stuck in a cycle, a cycle of death trying to produce a feeling, trying to produce something in my life. Crying out on the inside, will somebody save me? Can something save me? I know this is where I'm supposed to be. I don't know how I got here, but this is where I'm at. I never intended to be here, but this is where it led me. See, the hope or the, the road to failures paid with good intentions. I never meant to be here, but this is where I find myself, cold, numb, and broken, frozen in fear, frozen in time. Where has your hopelessness led you? How does your hopelessness dovetail into this man's testimony or maybe my testimony? Maybe it hasn't led to this extreme but I'm here to tell you it's just as cold and just as deadly as any hopelessness can be. Maybe you say, I haven't did that, Pastor Matt. I'm a good sinner. Maybe I haven't did that extreme. But I'm here to tell you, sin is sin and hopelessness is hopelessness. But see, this isn't how the story ends for this man. This isn't how the story ends for me. And you know what? This isn't how your story has to end also. See, Jesus comes at the right time to this man. See, if you back up to, to, to Mark chapter 4, you'll read that Christ has come from teaching and he's, he's wore out and he's tired. And he goes to his disciples and said, let's go to the other side. See, there was a divine appointment that was being scheduled by God that the demoniac didn't even know that was coming down the road. 
And you see, through that, what happens is they get into the boat and he's wore out from sleep or from teaching and he's asleep in the bow of the boat and the disciples, they come into a storm and the disciples think they're going to die and they wake him up and they go, do you even care? And he stands up and he says, peace, be still. See, what Jesus does is this. He transitions from one storm into now another man's storm. But see, this storm looks a little bit different. This is a storm of hopelessness where this man is bound in his mind. This man is bound in his emotions. This man is bound in his hopelessness. And he crosses over from one storm into another storm. And I believe here today that Christ is wanting to transition into your storm of hopelessness. He's wanting to stand up and he's wanting to say, peace, be still. See, a storm could not stop Christ. A grave could not stop Christ. A cross could not stop Christ. Christ come and he lived, he died, he was resurrected, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. Why? So he has access to your storm. He can step into your storm, and I believe today is a divine appointment for somebody's life. See, all the mistakes that this man had, all the mistakes that this man done, led him to this divine appointment, led him to this divine moment. And I remember this in my life, all the pain that I caused, all the pain that was called to me, uh, caused to me, all the mistakes that I did, everything that I regretted, it all came to a crescendo where I had a divine appointment with Jesus Christ. And here today, you might be sitting there with guilt. You might be sitting there with shame. You may be sitting there with mistakes. But I'm here to tell you, this is a divine moment where it's all led to this pinnacle in time where God wants to step in to your storm. Aren't you thankful for that here this morning? It goes on to say this. Mark chapter 5, verse 6 through 13. And when he saw Jesus from afar, talking about the the man, it says he ran and he worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, "What What have I do with you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of this man, you unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountain. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that you may enter him, that we may enter him, them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirit went out, entered the swine, There was about 2,000 of them. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. You see this man as Jesus gets out of the boat. You see as he transitions into this storm of this gentleman. You see what he does is he runs and he's captivated by the light. He's running toward the man with all his strength and all his might. See, he's captivated by the light. See, this symbolizes our attraction to Jesus' life, where we, light where we find hope and hopeless situations. See, the light of truth shines in darkness, and seeing the light of Jesus draws us in. See, as this man is surrounded by darkness and as this man is surrounded in a hopeless situation, he sees Christ step in, and all of a sudden he goes running to him. Drawn to that light, drawn to that truth. And I remember in my darkness, I remember seeing the light. I remember when the light of truth penetrated the darkness of my addiction. And I remember when the words of the song, I saw the light became real in my heart. 
I remember growing up in a small country church here locally, and I remember as the saints of old would sing the song as they were standing there with callous hands and, and, and sunburns on their face where they had worked hard all week in the sun, and as they would sing, I saw the light, and tears would come down from their eyes, and I would look at them as a kid and say, why do they sing it with such passion? Because they remembered that time when they saw the light. And just as this man was drawn to the light of Christ, I remember the time in, time in my life where I seen the light in darkness, where I was in such a dark place, but from afar off, I could see the light of truth. And when I seen the light of truth, it came alive in my heart. It came alive in my life. And all of a sudden, the words to the song, I saw the light, became true to me and true to my heart. <clears throat> But you see what happens here. See, he comes running. The man runs. He's worshiping God. But he's afraid. And he falls on his face and he says, don't torment me. Don't torment me. See, sometimes we fear that the one thing who loves us will be the, first, next, the, will be the very thing that might hurt us. But see, not with Jesus. See, at the end of the day, this isn't that man speaking. This is the spirit of hopelessness in his heart. See, this is the spirit of hopelessness that's, that he's possessed with. See, because he says, don't torment me before my time. See, even the enemy knows there's an end of time and knows he's a defeated foe. And he says, don't to torment me before my time. See, it isn't the man speaking, it's the hopelessness speaking in the man. Now, let me ask you this. What's your hopelessness saying to you? What's the lies of the enemy that are proceeding to fill your head of untruth? That when you see the light, you're drawn to it, but you're scared to approach, you're scared to embrace, you're scared to run toward it because of the lies of the hopelessness. Oh, you can never do that. Look what you've done in your past. Look at the mistakes that you've done. Oh, you'll be a hypocrite. Oh, that son will never be saved. Oh, you know what? You're going to lose your testimony. Oh, you're going to lose your anointing. Oh, look, that's the lies of the enemy that's trying to infiltrate your mind. That's not you speaking. That's the hopelessness trying to speak through you. What's your hopelessness saying to you? See, I remember the fear I had when I encountered Jesus. My hopelessness said, don't go. You can't do it. There's no way. But my heart said, go embrace. Everything in my flesh said, no, I can't do it. No, I'll fail. No, I'll be a hypocrite. No, I can't live the straight and narrow. No, I won't be able to do it on my, I can't stay sober. I'm too jacked up. My mind's gone. There's no way. But my heart said, run and embrace, run and embrace. And as I ran and I embraced, he embraced me. Somebody needs to feel that embrace from Christ here today. Some people came in here today hopeless. You've came in here and you've covered it up for years, but I'm here today. Christ wants to embrace you with the hope, the eternal hope of Jesus Christ. Listen to your heart here. Listen to your heart. But Jesus says something to him. He says, what is your name. See, honesty and repentance are essential for deliverance from hopelessness. See, the man reveals his name's legion. Over 6,000 or around 6,000 demons that this man had in him. This man's got a lot of problems. He said, my name is legion. See, there was a crossroads that was put in this man's life. There was a crossroads that he stood at. Will I be honest with Christ or will I not be honest with Christ? Will I stay exactly where I'm at or will I transition into hope? See, God don't want to just stand in or just stand, transition to your hopelessness. He wants to deliver you from your hopelessness. 
See, we want a little patch job in our hopelessness. Come make the situation a little bit better. Come just, just fix it just a few minutes so I might get a week of relief. But that ain't how God works. God wants to deliver you from the snares. He wants to deliver you from the enemy. He wants to set you in heavenly places. And once you have that identity and position of who you are in Christ, it don't matter the circumstances anymore. It don't matter what you're facing anymore. Because everything you go into, you have hope because your hope is in Jesus Christ. Christ. <clears throat> See, this man couldn't run any further. Now he finds himself running and falling at the feet of Jesus Christ. See, and I remember this. I remember when I couldn't run anymore, and Jesus demanded my name. I remember that he loved me enough that he put a crossroads in my life. He said, you ain't riding the fence anymore, you're not hiding in the crowd anymore, and you're not going to justify your actions anymore. You're going to choose life or you're going to choose death. See, he loves us enough to do that. He loves us enough to put crossroads in your life. He loves you enough to say, what is your name? There came a time when I couldn't hide behind my problems, but I had to say, my name is a drug addict. My name is a broken man. My name is a sinner. I had to be honest with God. And when I was honest with God, deliverance came to my life. I remember finding myself in a 13-month Christian rehab. And I had a mentor, my father in the Lord. Bishop Ronald Bryant went on to be with the Lord. Mentor me years after until he got cancer. And he passed away. And he had a thick Maine accent, and I have a proper American accent. <laughs> so when we talked, it was like building the Tower of Babel, I think. I couldn't hardly understand what he was saying. He couldn't hardly understand what I was saying. But the Holy Spirit hooked us up and worked to move. And I remember my first counseling session. And I remember me being there, you know. Sitting there, and I'm not as bad as all these other people in here. They go, well, they're going to let me out of here early. I'm good. I read my Bible this morning. <clears throat> I'm sitting there, and he's asking me, what's really going on with you? Why are you here? And I start ugly crying, ugly crying. And I'm blaming it on my wife. I'm blaming it on my mom. I'm blaming it on my grandma, I'm blaming it on my dad, I'm blaming it on everybody, the government, the inflation, the recession, I'm blaming it on everybody, it's everybody's fault. And I remember this clear as day, clear as day, it, it, it just, it still sends shivers down my spine because I know there's, there's three or four times in my life when I know the voice of God spoke to me verbally and tangibly in my life and it was all, always through other people that didn't even know what was going on. And I remember clear as day he had some tissues on his desk, and they were over by him. And as I ugly cried and uh, blamed everybody, and it was everybody's fault, I remember clear as day, he pushed them box over to me. And he said, I'm not here to fix them, I'm here to help you. And what that was was the voice of God saying, what is your name? You're not going to hide behind the problems anymore. You're not going to hide behind everything that even could be justified. No, 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 no. What is your name? And I thank God that he loves us enough that he will put those crossroads in our life where we can't play church no more. We can't hide behind justified problems. But he comes to a place where he loves us enough where he goes, what is your name? See, before I could transition from hopeless, I had to acknowledge my hopelessness. I had to be honest, and deliverance followed that. And not only did it follow it, but it, follow it followed miraculously. God's trying to remove you from that. And I believe with all my heart that someone here this morning needs to get honest with God. See, you're stuck in a cycle of hopelessness. You keep denying it, but everybody else knows. You keep denying it and think, if I just ignore it, it will go away. 
But God here has put a crossroads in your life and he's asking you, what is your name? Do you want to transition from hopelessness into a hope in Christ? Do you want to transition this morning from that cycle of dysfunction, from that cycle of I'm doing good now, instead of going, no, I'm doing good for eternity. I'm doing good now, but don't ask me in three hours. See, there's a cycle of, of hopelessness, and Christ is asking, what is your name? And miraculous deliverance came. Miraculous deliverance came to this man. You see, the, the swine were, the, Christ cast the demons into the swine, and the swine runs off the hill. It's miraculous what takes place, and God wants to do a miraculous work in your life this morning. It goes on to say this, Mark chapter 5, verse 14 through 20 says this. So those who fed the swine fled, and they, and they told in the, it in the city and in the country that they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then Jesus came, or then, then they came to Jesus and saw the one, talking about the man, who had been demon-possessed and had a legion sitting clothed in his right man. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them now what had happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be, the, be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis and all, all that Jesus had done for him, and they all marveled. So as this miraculous deliverance takes place, the men that were herding the pigs take off running. They go into the city and they're like, hey, you got to come out here and see what's happened. So all of a sudden, a crowd comes and when they come up on the man, and everybody would have been familiar with this man, he was clothed. He was in his right mind. That word in the Greek, right mind, actually means he was sober-minded, means he was making right decisions. See, this man is miraculously delivered from the pain and the hopelessness he was in. But see... The ones that seen him in his pain were the ones that were now seeing him in his healing. And a lot of you here are paralyzed in time because people seen you in your pain. And you think you never can get past that in your life. People seen me at my lowest. People seen me when I made mistakes. There's people in my family that I hurt. There's things that I've done. And you've frozen in time being hopeless because you never can get past that. But I'm here to tell you, if you submit to Christ, those who see you in your pain will be the same ones that are going to see you in your healing. I remember my grandfather, Bishop W.B. McHugh, a general in the faith. Planted churches all over uh, uh, Florida. Let's just say this on his tombstone, it says, a soldier for Christ. That's the kind of man he was. That's on his tombstone. His name and a soldier for Christ is written on it. That's the kind of man he was. And I know because of the decisions I made, I disappointed him. You know why? Because you didn't have to worry about what was on his mind. I wish there was more men like that today. He would tell you exactly, you're better than that. You shouldn't be making decisions like that. You know what? You're raised better than that, right? There was a pain that I carried by disappointing him. There was a pain that I carried of, of, of bringing reproach against the family because it is such a good family. But you know what? One of the highlights of my life is this. The same man that I honored and that I love on his deathbed, 
was the same man that seen me in my pain was the same man that seen me on fire for God. And he was the same man that seen me sell out to God. And he was the same man that seen a radical change in my life to the point when he's on his deathbed, he told me how proud he was of me. Listen. I'm talking about the redemptive power of Jesus Christ here. I'm talking about you who are in your pain tonight. Today is the same people, or the people that see you in your pain are going to be the same people that see you in your healing. But look what this produces in this man. This happens. There's a submission that takes place. See, the disciples were just trying to get out of the boat. They just come through a storm. This man is doing everything he can to get into the boat. No, I'm going with this guy. See, he wants to be a disciple of Jesus. See, he didn't come and find hope to go run and do his own thing. No, he didn't come and find hope and say, all right, thank you. I'm good now. I'm going back to my old life. He didn't go back to cutting himself. He didn't go back to the tombs. He didn't go back to that old life. You know what? No, he goes, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm getting in the boat with him. Whatever it takes, I'm going to follow him. And I remember this in my life. I remember as I go to check out of that rehab, it's February 17th in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, coldest place on the face of this earth. I'm like, get me back to Florida. I need some sun. Cold. All my stuff's in a Winn-Dixie bag. Y'all know what that is. I know y'all know that. A Winn-Dixie bag, not even a Walmart bag, a Winn-Dixie bag. Man, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen this next season in my life. I don't know if I'm going to be sober. I don't know what buzzsaw I'm going to run into when I come home. I don't know where I'm going to work. I don't know any of that stuff, but I knew this, that I was in the boat with Jesus. And I know wherever he was going to take me, I was going to follow And no matter what happened, I was going to cling close to him. I was going to follow him, whatever it takes, because I found hope in a hopeless situation. I found light in darkness. I found peace in pain. I found everything I've been looking for in Jesus Christ. Whatever it takes. But look what Christ says here. Christ tells him, no, 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 no. Go home. And preach. Go home to your family and tell them the compassion that they have, that the Lord has had on you. See, Jesus didn't set this man up for failure. See, Jesus knew something that we know now because of revelations. Because we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So he didn't send the man and say, even come follow me. No, he sends the man and goes back, share your testimony. Because every time you share your testimony, you're going to be an overcomer. Every time you share your testimony, it's going to point to the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Every time you share your testimony, you're going to walk in freedom. See, the testimony was for him, but it was also for others. I'm about to say something that's going to shock a lot of people. But I said verbally multiple times, I'll never be a preacher. Growing up in a Christian home, growing up around preachers, you know, you see behind the scenes, right? You go to a play and you see the outside play that nobody's being fake it, but you go behind the scenes and you see the wood boards and you see the nails and you see how they put it all together. And when it's all said and done, you realize, you know what? Everybody's human is a human. And because you see that, it can put a taste in your mouth. I don't think I want to do that with my life. And I used to say, no, I will never be a preacher. But the very thing that God, that I said I would never do is the very thing God said, no, you go home and you're going to preach. I said, no, 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 I'll go visit you in jail. I'll go to the recovery ministry. I'll go street preaching. I'll, give me all that. I love doing that. No, no, you're going to stand up in front of people and you're going to declare my goodness to them. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. In closing, I want to share a story with you. So last hunting season, I was out hunting, and I was in a a blind, a pop-up blind. If you're not experienced with that, it's a 
It's a pop-up tent. Right, it's got little stakes in it. What happens, you got a chair in there, and you get in there with your gun, and then you look down, and then you wait for deer to come by, and you, you put something on the table. And so I'm going out there to go, hey, I'm going out there to go hunting. And, of course, I don't check the weather because, you know, a bad day hunting is better than a good day at work, you know. You don't work in the rain, but you'll hunt in the rain in a heartbeat. So I ain't worried about the weather. So I get out there, and I'm sitting, and all of a sudden, a storm comes in. I'm like, well, you know, it's Florida. This ain't my first rodeo. It'll come on. It'll come on. This storm comes. It gets worse and worse and worse. And all of a sudden, my phone just goes haywire with that high-pitched beep. Tornado down in Baldwin. And I'm in Baldwin. And then after that went off, my mom called because her baby's out there, and she's going to take care of her baby. Hey, you out in the woods, you better get to the house right now. There's a tornado down. We just seen it. It's over here. You better get. The storm was terrible. So I decide, hey, I got to get out. I got to, whatever. I'm going to get soaked, whatever. It's raining, rain. I jump out with my 243. I'm zipping up. All of a sudden, lightning strikes. And it was probably 500 yards away, but it sounded like it was two foot away. And the hair on my arm stood up because I don't have none on my head to stand up. <laughs> And I teleported, I teleported from the woods to my mother's house in probably 30 seconds. I don't know how I moved that fast. I don't know how I drove that fast. It was insane. But while we were waiting there for the storm, the storm passed over. But I called my wife because she was out in town in Orange Park. And we were over on the west side. And I called her and I said, hey, babe, there's a bad storm coming but don't worry, it won't last long. It won't last long. And this story here, what I've shared with you, this event that took place in my testimony is to remind you, there's three phases of life. Either you're in a storm, you just come out of a storm, or you're about to go in a storm. I wish I could tell you something different. But see, we have hope in all of that. And I'm here to remind you that the storm don't last long. As we all stand all over the building. If you'll bow your heads. I didn't do this the first service, but I want to do that. I want to do it this service. If you'll bow your heads. So if you're here and you're under the sound of my voice and you do not know Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you you have no hope. I don't care what money you got in the bank. I don't care what plan you have in front of you. I don't care. You can tell me, if you do not have Jesus Christ, you do not have have hope because in one moment, everything can change. But those who have Christ, everything can change in one moment, but Christ does not change. And I want to give you an opportunity. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. The Word of God says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips, you will be saved. It didn't say, go get it together and come back. It didn't say, I might save you. Oh, if you do it, say it the right way, I'll say it. No, it says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips, you will be saved. And if you want this hope that I'm talking about here today, I want to offer that to you. If you'll bow your heads. On the count of three, if anybody wants to receive Jesus Christ, If anybody wants to come to know Christ, if anybody wants to recommit their hearts, maybe you need to recommit your heart. Maybe you've got sidetracked. I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe this is a first time salvation. If you're here and you want to receive Jesus Christ, on the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See that hand? See that hand? Amen. See that hand? The balcony. Amen. See that hand? Praise the Lord. See that hand? Amen. Amen. Listen, those who are about to pray this prayer, you're just about to make the most important decision of your life. There are hands in the balcony, hands down here. When you're done praying this, Jesus Christ said he's the door. And when you enter through him, you start a discipleship journey. We want to meet you at the Connect Center. We want to get you started on that discipleship journey. So if you bow your heads, we're going to pray. Repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. 
Lord, you are my Lord and Savior. Lord, I put all trust into you. Thank you for dying for my sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. As they worship and as they sing, these altars are going to be open for anybody that wants to come down and pray. We'd love to pray with you, our pastors, our elders, our, um, our prayer team. If anybody needs prayer for specific issues, maybe you need to put a hopeless situation at the ground. Maybe you need to come in obedience and fall at the feet of Jesus. If you want to make that decision, we'll be down here to stand beside you during that. Let's worship. <laughs>